the white cliffs of Dover lie steeply out of the sea which ages ago cut Britain away from Europe and made it secure. Not for 900 years has an enemy crossed the sea, seen and pleasant island. The sea, serving in the office of a moat, protecting against infection in the hand of war, as Shakespeare put it. The sea has deeply influenced our history and the character of the people. We are a seagoing people, an island people, proud, aloof, and a bit arrogant, perhaps, as island people are often wont to be. Long ago, we learned to use the oceans of the world for our good, for trade and conquest. This little island of Great Britain once ruled almost half the earth. The sea dominates the climate of the British Isles, which lie as far north as Hudson Bay and parts of Alaska. One would expect to find it very cold and harsh indeed, but not so. The sea tempers the climate. The winds which blow over the British Isles come mainly from the southwest, passing over the ocean and the warm North Atlantic drift before reaching land. The ocean is warmer in winter and cooler in summer than the land. The winds take their temperature from the ocean, providing the British Isles with a moderate climate without extremes of heat or cold. Summer in London, for example, is considerably cooler than in New York, and winter is much warmer. Ours is an extremely rainy climate, however, but we consider this normal. The frequent showers provide the lovely lawns, the lush meadows, and the rich green countryside. It's cloudy, damp, and gray much of the time, I'm afraid. But then may come heavenly clear days in the wake of a breeze, bringing the fresh tang of the sea. And all Britain seems to take to the beaches. The British Isles, home of 54 million people. England, Wales, and Scotland make up the island of Great Britain, a land area about the size of the state of Minnesota. From Firth in the north to Land's End in the south, a distance of approximately 650 miles. Great Britain and Northern Ireland, or Ulster, together make up the United Kingdom. Southern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, is independent of Great Britain, cutting all ties after World War II. After a long struggle, I might add. After 800 years of struggle, I might add. Dublin is the capital of the Republic of Ireland, a country of but four and a half million souls. A hundred years ago, there were nearly twice this number. Emigration, which seems to have become a national custom, and a low birth rate account for the dwindling population over the last century. Ireland is a poor country, an agricultural country. The land itself is so poor that it can barely support the people who must live on it. With industry very slow in developing here, Irishmen often must emigrate in order to earn enough to keep alive. It's a pity. Ireland is the least densely populated part of the British Isles. It's like a saucer. A mountainous rim surrounds the central lowland. It rarely rains hard, but the water does seem to keep dripping and drizzling down most of the time. It's a bit too cool and damp for crops, but fine for livestock. More than half the farmland produces hay or pasture for cattle. Livestock is Ireland's most important agricultural product. About a fifth of the country is bogland, wet, marshy, waterlogged ground. The bogs provide fuel, but on the other hand, they take up a good deal of land that might be put to better use. Decayed vegetable material such as grass and moss, has formed the spongy matter 
called peace or turf. Sad to say, turf is our greatest natural resource. There are a few forests, little coal, few minerals here. After it is cut, the turf is dried and used for heating and cooking. Potatoes are still pretty much the staple food for the country people. When the crop failed in 1846 and 7, more than three quarters of a million people died of starvation and better than a million left Ireland, most of them going to America. The Irish farmer leads a simple and a very poor life by the standards of other countries, particularly our English neighbours. Only recently have farmers begun to mechanise to any extent and adopt modern agricultural methods, long common elsewhere. And there's still too much of the stubborn feeling that if a horse and cat was good enough for me, father, it's good enough for me. The city of Belfast is the capital of Northern Ireland, of Ulster. Things are a good deal different here, considerably more prosperous. Industry, rather than agriculture, is the important thing in Ulster. The people are mostly Protestants, you know, Church of England where in the south, in the Republic of Ireland, we're Roman Catholic. Differences about religion have been the source of most of our troubles with the English. The people of Belfast are British subjects. The six northern counties of Ulster didn't care to join us when we separated from Britain. And for that matter, they still don't. The people of Dublin are citizens of another nation. It is a sad thing to be a divided land like this. Two countries on the same green little island. We'll move on now to Scotland, which occupies the northern part of the island of Great Britain. At its greatest length, about 280 miles, 146 miles wide home of just over five million people, two-thirds of whom live in the southern lowlands, the industrial heart of the country. The Scots are a people quite apart from the Irish and the English, with their own distinctive customs, character and history. In Edinburgh Castle, Mary, Queen of Scots, gave birth to the son who became King of England and of Scotland as well uniting the two kingdoms. Since the 16th century, Scotland and England have been politically united. Edinburgh is Scotland's capital and heart of an intense cultural life largely independent of that of England. Glasgow is the largest city, an industrial city of well over a million people, center of Britain's shipbuilding industry, Ocean bound Scotland on all sides except for its southern 60 mile long border with England. The west coast is slashed with sea locks and fringed with islands, nearly 800 of them. Scotland's drowned and glaciated topography recalls that of Norway. There's a stern and wild look to much of the land. Farms cover more than three quarters of the country with most of the land suitable only for rough grazing for cattle and sheep. Life is hard in the highlands and on the offshore islands. There are few of the modern conveniences. Women still spin the famous Scottish tweeds by hand and gather turf to warm their small stone cottages. Fishing villages dot the coastline. Fishing, long a vital occupation for Britain. A very large commercial fishing fleet brings in considerable quantities of cod, herring, and mackerel. Fish is an extremely important part of the British diet, but fishing occupies a very small percentage of the population, probably much less than 1%. 
the houses of fishermen stretch back from the water's edge. Life for the rural people of Scotland is simple and unsophisticated. It's a frugal, sparse existence compared with the lives of most Britons. Both the people and the land of Scotland are very different from England, the largest and wealthiest units of the United Kingdom. With a population of over 42 million people, England is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Yet, as one journeys through the countryside, there is a generally uncrowded appearance. The land, for the most part, is gently rolling, with low mountains in the north, rising to little more than 3,000 feet. There are extremes of neither climate nor topography here. Over two-thirds of the land is an improved farmland. Yet fewer than 5% of the people work in agriculture. Agriculture in England can be best described as running at a pitch of industrial efficiency. Highly mechanized farms, incredible crop yields, high-quality cattle, and famous breeds of livestock developed here. In spite of the efficiency of English agriculture and large proportion of cultivated land, there can be no question of farmers producing enough food to feed the population. There is simply not enough land. Only about half of Britain's food needs can be produced at home. We English love this little land in a deep and special way. To understand why, I think one must experience the beauty of the countryside, of the hills and valleys, the hedgerows and ever-winding roads, the lovely, tranquil villages. Our history, written across the landscape in ancient castles, at cathedrals, in great and noble homes, in monuments to immortal Englishmen, in inns and buildings, carefully preserved as they have been for centuries. The south of England is considerably more pleasant than the industrial Midlands and the north, much of which is quite frankly dreary indeed. Cities like Manchester are melancholy affairs, containing every kind of factory and 200 years of grime. It was here in the Midlands that the Industrial Revolution, which changed the world forever, began. The Industrial Revolution, which made England the world's first great industrial nation. The iron ore deposits of the Midlands gave impetus to the Industrial Revolution. Britain has both iron and coal the ingredients of steel. This is one of the reasons why she became the world's first industrial nation. Coal mines crowd the valleys of southern Wales, a hill country, since the 16th century politically united with England. This is one of the major coal-producing regions of the world, with sufficient reserves to last at least 200 years. Aside from coal and iron, Britain possesses few other natural resources of much importance. The great steel mills of England are located near the sources of iron and coal in the Midlands. For nearly 200 years, Britain was the world's largest steel producer, though she has now lost this position. The textile industry also centers in the Midlands near coal sources. The Industrial Revolution began with textile, with the invention of steam-powered looms and the introduction of the factory system of manufacturing. Although the raw cotton and most of the wool used to manufacture fabrics has always had to be imported, Britain was for years the world's leading producer of textiles and textile machinery. In the potteries, one may observe the patient craftsmanship 
and rigid insistence on uncompromising quality so characteristic of many English products. Industrial techniques, methods, and design, deeply rooted in tradition, are unfortunately often slow in changing, in modernizing, making it sometimes difficult for England to compete with other nations on world markets once almost exclusively British. In aircraft production, in hundreds of fields, England is fighting today to maintain her position as a great industrial nation. Although no longer the world's foremost industrial power, and although the economy is not growing at the rate one might wish, British industry is still formidable and flourishing, producing an enormous and ever-expanding range of goods. By far the greatest percentage of the English population works in manufacturing. They enjoy one of the world's highest living standards. London is the heart of the English-speaking world, nerve center of the British Commonwealth of Nations, which covers one-fifth of the earth. London, along with New York and Tokyo, is one of the world's three largest cities. The Houses of Parliament, England, the birthplace of parliamentary government, with a history of democracy stretching back 700 years. Westminster Abbey, where England's kings and queens have been crowned and buried since 1066. Buckingham Palace, residence of British sovereigns, maintained in splendor, was allowed no political power. London docks, where one can observe in action the single most important thing to remember about the British Isles. They live by trade. Unable to raise enough food for her population, Britain must exchange manufactured goods and services with other countries in return for something to eat. Without food and raw materials from overseas, Britain would utterly collapse. More than any other nation, Great Britain depends upon trade. Literally a matter of life and death for every Briton. To pay for our multitudinous imports, we depend not only upon the export of manufactured goods to earn foreign exchange, but other things are important as well. Shipping services, the tourist trade, the sale of commercial, financial and insurance services abroad. Although the people of Britain are more prosperous today than at any other time in their history, the nation is at the crossroads. We have remarkable assets in our mechanized farms and huge merchant fleets, in our immense manufacturing capacity. The people, with their qualities of endurance, fortitude and courage, are perhaps our greatest strength. It could be argued that no nation in the past has made such impressive contributions to the world as England. The symbols of Britain's might and glory are still there, but British power, prestige, and influence have seriously declined in a rapidly changing post-war world. Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It was under the first Elizabeth that England ceased to be a small provincial nation and sent her explorers, traders, and colonizers to the limits of the known world. Today, under a new Elizabeth, the future is in doubt. If we are to remain a world power, great ingenuity and enterprise are called for. Thus that so-called bulldog tenacity which has seen us through many crises in the past. <laughs>